Today's show on our game, Michael Verney in the hot seat today. Shane Stapleton is getting ready for championship. Uh, I think he's away doing a, pre a pre-season uh, training camp somewhere exotic, but delighted to be joined by Damien Lawler from RT Sport. Damien, how are you? Morning, Mick. I don't think, um, I don't think Shane did a pre-season even when he was hurling, to be honest with you. No, probably not. I'm sure he's somewhere working on his tan at this very moment in time, though. Um, oh, Damien, just even from, from your perspective, working with RT and that, uh, mm. I'd say it's an exciting time, the more than an exciting time for myself and anyone working in GA at the moment. It's It's been busy the last couple of months, but it's about to get a hell of a lot busier, and it's an exciting time. A busy time, but an exciting time. Yeah, you put the finger on it there, Mick, to be honest with you. Like, I don't know how long I'm in this business now, but I'm in it a long, long time. And you always got that that buzz around the championship. And I suppose back when I did start out, like you had an unbelievable gap between the league and the championship. And you had a serious run in to where I grew up with, say, in Munster or Hurling Championship. And you don't have that anymore. And the, I'm kind of the one thing I'm picking up there, uh, you know, yesterday and today is we can't get to celebrate this or this is parked. We're looking ahead to Sunday straight away. And it just goes to show you that the, the, the turnaround times are just non-existent now. It's uh, in, in order to give the, the club the club scene probably room to breed, Mick, uh, we've had to go maybe with a 37, 38-week inter-county season. Um, and I, I think that, in my own head anyway, we're probably maybe a week or two off the perfect juncture, whereby yeah. you, you get two weeks to enjoy your league title victory. Um, otherwise, Mick, people are going to look at the leagues and say, hang on a second now. So I do believe this season coming, it retrospectively would be crucial for next year's leagues to see what teams take out of it, particularly in football. When you, you have to go for the league, maybe maintain your Sam Maguire status, you have to do yourself justice in the provincial championship and yet peak for the round robin series after that. So there's, there's a lot to tell just yet, but to answer your question, even today, like it's actually nice out there and there's a, there's a bit of a buzz in, in the weather as well. And mm. I know it's still very early to be starting championship, but there's nothing like it. This is definitely the best time of the year. The, the anticipation, every county is something to build for. I should have said at the outset, today's show brought to you by orgoretro.com. I'm, do I'm donning this jersey because we had a good win yesterday. Um, <laughs> now, we had a good win over Kildare, and I know yeah. you're, uh, you're living in Kildare now. Um, it's a bit of a kind of a, we'll go into it a bit more in a minute, but it's a difficult one with the le with the leagues as well in Hurling for the likes of, you know, Kildare come up going into Division 1. You are mm. really been thrown into the, you've been thrown into the deep end. The more than Offaly will be, the more than Westmead were yeah. this year. Offaly were a couple of years ago. Uh, it's a difficult one, but you were you were at the game, uh, like a real tale of two halves, Damien Ball. Yeah. You finished Offaly 24 points, Kildare 118, but Kildare were not in control at half time, but probably should have been further ahead at half time. They should have had Mick, and I suppose to answer your first question, really, th there's a massive step up now between the likes of Kildare, Offaly, and even a Westmead or a Leash. There's no point in saying other words. The Gulf is is huge, but I was looking at the the promotion of of Kildare hurling during the week. You know, not so much Offaly, Mick, because you know you you have a tradition down there, and it's more traditional. And even the Offaly crowd wouldn't have been as big as the Kildare crowd yesterday. And mm. even though going to Division One, you probably would get your ass handed to you in quite a few occasions. I still think from a an optics point of view or a marketing point of view or or a, a progressive point of view would have been huge for Kildare to get up there, to get up to that level, to have a Division 1 status beside her name and to fundamentally improve the work that's been going on. Like, I'm probably here 10, 10 plus years. I, just, I can see it at ground level. My kids are playing. Um, the, the passion up here for Hurling is, is massive now, massive. And it would have been lovely for the county to, to get up to that level and just see what it was all about. Uh, they'll find it hard next year with the likes of Leash coming back down. But uh, in terms of conditioning and S&C and all that, that'll be a gap straight away. But to go to yesterday's game, awfully were deserved winners. Um, they weren't spectacular by any means. It took them a while to get into the game. They had a defensive probably masterclass in that after four, 14 or 15 minutes, uh, the likes of Samson, uh, Keneally, you know, all these guys... Crowded out the Kildare half forward midfielders and they started winning more breaking ball there and they got a foothold in the game. Now, they didn't play anything like the, the running game that Kildare played, Mick. They, they went direct uh, more often than not to a two man full forward line. They pulled a lot of people back. But Kildare pulled back as well, but they like to run through the lines. That let them down just a little bit at times during the game. If you're looking from a Kildare point of view, what cost them? They definitely had a few wides in the first half. It absolutely killed them. They were under pressure from the offly defence while they shot. Probably should have a bit more composure. And then, uh, I suppose, they missed a few frees in the second half as well. And a lot of the scores that Offaly got in the first half were from turnovers as well. So if I was yeah. Johnny Kelly, I'd be very, very happy with that. From an Offaly point of view, there's still another gear to find, for sure. 
Uh, I'm not sure if there's two years to find, but there's still another one. Johnny was very concerned about the makeup of the half forward line and the full forward line yesterday. He spent an awful lot of time trying to direct the traffic there in terms of how they go out on the on their own puck out, how they react to the Kildare puck out. Effectively, he wanted more work rate out of them in, in that area. Th- that eventually came in the second half. There was only one team in it, but yet near the end. Uh, Kildare had a heap of missed chances again, Mick, and yeah. probably had a chance to draw it with Paddy McKenna's shot, which Stephen Corcoran saves. And, and then he uh, belted it out over the terrace. <laughs> he did. I, he, I, I, I definitely saw him going into the balcony of one of the, the, the apartments in, beside O'Moore Park. So I'd say somebody was having a cup of tea and a sandwich, and uh, an angry Corcoran sitter came in on the I side. I wouldn't anyway. mind uh, Brian Stapleton that used to play with Leach, <laughs> used to live in those apartments, and you'd always see when any big game was in O'Moore Park to be deck chairs sitting out. It was usually during the summer, and they'd all just be watching. But he might, he might have got a brand new. Uh, a brand new O'Neill's uh, peeled into the window, maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, well, t- in terms of doing... Yeah, go on, yeah. It, it, in terms of doing an overview in a game, there's no better place than the apartments in Humber Park anyway. They're, you're looking right down on the yeah. action. You can see the structures and the shape very, very well. I actually got up into the bird's nest in Nolan Park recently for the Leinster College's final. And it is amazing what you see when you're really high up. And that's why a lot of uh, yeah. statisticians, coaches, managers even want to see yeah. the behind the goal kind of angle now because you can see yeah. so much more. It's well, amazing. Well, just to pick up on that, Mick, like, so I gave most of my professional career up in level seven in Crow Park or the old press box in Crow Park. And, you know, you know yourself, the, the view is is absolutely spectacular. I mean, even if you didn't know a huge amount about the games, I think you'd be able to see what way teams are setting up, where the runners are coming from, the shape and the structure. Um, wh- where I am with, with RT at the moment on the sideline, you don't get anything like that vantage point. What you, what you do get is the body language. You actually hear, yeah. the, the, you hear the exchanges between... The player, manager, opposing managers, uh, usually the fourth official gets an old whack of it as well. Uh, but you can't, like you couldn't even see the far side of the pitch in terms of reading what's happening on the far wing, for example, Mick. So that elevated view, I am amazed. I suppose there is a traditional thing in the GEA whereby an inter-county manager feels the need to be given, the, give, you know, given heat or given a presence to his players on the sideline. But I am amazed that more and more coaches, particularly maybe the younger coaches, are not taking that elevated view um, and going up there. And I suppose you've seen a few managers. Jack O'Connor would often go up and come back down. Peter Keane, you know, they used to do all that. You definitely get a much better, particularly in the opening 10 minutes of a game or the opening 10 of a second half, just to see what you're facing. There, there's nothing like the vantage. Like, you can't really see on the sideline is what I'm trying to say to you. It's too far yeah. of a reach to, to get to the projected to the far wing. It's a funny one. You, uh, it depends on your managerial approach as well. If you are kind of blood and thunder, lean sheedy style, you want to be there and yeah. you want your energy to nearly, you know, transfer into your players. It's a wonder Jim Gavin didn't do it actually because he was so cool and calculated and he wasn't offering them anything from the sideline really. Do you know what I mean? Like he was quite calm, but it's amazing. It's, it's, like, yeah. The rugby do it like the rugby do it the whole time. They do now. It's a bit claustrophobic for me with the rugby. Like you couldn't even swing like that in a box. But I think with Gavin, maybe I fully agree with you. I, I looked over at him a good few times, and you're talking about usually against Mayo. You're going into the melting pot of the last three minutes of an All Ireland final, and it's up for grabs, and it's helter skelter. And with all the bad luck Mayo got in finals over the years, you know, any neutral would be kind of saying. Just they're going to get a rub of the green eventually, like you know they're conceding own goals and 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 and, and stuff like that. But Jim Gavin was constantly there like that, and I wonder was his presence in such a calm demeanor was that maybe the fill up that the Dublin players needed? Whereas maybe with the likes of Davy Fitz or Ashidi, the players maybe come, get off the thunder almost. I, I'm not sure, yeah. but yeah, you're right. He would have been a candidate to go up, and I, he always argued anyway that his job was done and he didn't need to be shouting at the players. But look. Uh, he's he's in the minority in the GEA terms there, Mick, I think. <laughs> it, has, it helps when you have the players as well. Uh, <laughs> just a couple of comments in there. Uh, Tom O'Keane, Verney Offaly uh, win Kildare. Mead Hurland is in a great position on beating yet. The good yeah. win at the weekend. Just a good question. I might just, I'll might i fire this to you first, Damo, and then I'll have a go at it myself. Detox uh, 101. Any direct feedback from teams that play Division 1 and were hammered every game? Anyone saying they would have been better staying in Division 2 uh, and have frequent success? Any drop-off in players in those teams? Anecdotally, Damo, would you have been chatting many different lads maybe that would have played down there and what would yeah. the thoughts have been on it? Yeah, well, my thoughts are very, very simple on it. A lot of the players who maybe even wanted to Look, there's a couple of key players missing for both sides this year. I mean, like, you know, like the likes of Oshin from, from Offaly and that, but like Jack Sheridan from Kildare as well. No, I think my, my feedback over the years is that a lot of players would go travelling maybe and 
maybe regret the fact then that they're not around for a tilt at Division One. After all, like that's what you if you're if you're twelve years of age, thirteen years of age, and you're hurling in a Kildare, um, I won't say awfully because if you're that age, maybe you know awfully worldly McCarthy back then, but you you have to aspire to get up there. Mm. Um, the problem for me, Mick, is I've seen you know your your texture is right. I've seen so many teams over my years go up to a level, um, and, and more recently what Cheddar did with Leash, but Bonner and Carlo before that, Brian Hanley and West Meath. Um, you know, I saw Westmeath nearly push Galway very, very close in the championship. Right. I've seen all that. But slowly, there's been a regression back down. Now, probably not so much in Westmeath's case. that They've really probably held firm. But were they ever as good as they could have been? I don't think so. And there's a reason. You need central backing at this stage, Mick. I, I'm always banging this drum. The work is going in on the ground. Um, it's complicated. In a lot of these cases, hurling is not the first sport in the county. Uh, you have to get funding. You have to get your academy structure right. You have to make sure that you're you're really going well. This sounds naive, but at under 12, 13, 14, 15, but 16. It's your next generation. That, that, is, that is your next generation. It's your next generation. Like, yeah, yeah. And, and they have to be in the forest still. They have to be in the Arabon. They have to be competing in Fela B, Fela A. They, you know, I, I see my young lad goes around. He, he hurls with Nace under 12s. They, they would play hurling and football anywhere in the country to get a game and to get a good game. And I think the point is, there's a huge amount of work being done on the ground. However, so few hurling counties out there capable of competing at the top level. And even the gap between Limerick and the rest is enormous at the moment. And you, you do need more help, Mick, in terms of increased investment. That investment needs to be sustained for a five or seven year project from Crow Park. You should be held accountable. You should be hit. You should be given measurements to hit. And if you don't hit them, then the funding stops. But if you're able to get participation numbers up, if you're able to increase the number of clubs hurling in the county, if you're able to have a presence of coaches in the school, if you're able to show that the work has been done on the ground, I think the very least you deserve is a, is a, an isolated look from Crow Park to say, hang on now, we have a Kildare or a Meath who are capable in seven years of being a Dublin. You know, let's try and push the bars up here and let's try and get the, the structures going better domestically. And that hasn't happened really. The Enster Council uh, mostly have, have, you know, have, have looked at projects. They've looked at designated groups. They've looked at increased funding, but they, they need more than Leinster Council help make. My answer to your texture is there needs to be a kind of a significant investment for a sustained period for a county to try and get up to Division 1 and keep it there. You know, and you're talking schools, you're talking GDAs, you're talking increased resources, um, you're, you're talking maybe spreading the gospel at underage. I see in Kildare here, there's, there's clubs trying to get hurling off the ground and they're not finding it easy. And they need help in this. And they need equipment as well. So I don't know what's going to happen here with those counties, Mick, but until that happens, you're going to see the yo-yo effect, I think. you know, Different with Dublin. They had a, a CEO who was able to strategize the, the whole way through. They got big, big money from, from, the, from the GEA as well over the years, let's be honest about it. And they have a massive population. You know, other counties don't have, have any of that really. Yeah, and hurling has been made sustainable in Dublin as a result of that. Um, now, I would have been chatting to a few of the Offaly lads down through the years, and they love getting a crack off Division 1 teams. They don't think about the idea of being beaten by 15 or 20 points, or they don't think of cumulative, cumulative negative score difference after. They just, like I remember Cork played Offaly in the league in Borough last year, and the lads just couldn't wait for a crack off. And it was the same when they played Limerick. And you need to be uh, exposed to the standard. Now, I will say this, I think the old Division 1A and Division 1B, mm -hmm. where, like, Westmead were shown in with, you know, five really big hitters this year. Probably teams ranked yeah. one, three, four. Do you know what I mean? Whereas if you're playing teams ranked eight, nine, ten, eleven, if Offaly are in Division 1 next year, which they are, and they're playing Westmead, Antrim, Wexford, Dublin, like... Mm -hmm. You know, you fancy your chances of getting results in those games and you, you're not going to be hammered. And if you're able to earn your place in Division 1 against the real big hitters, then so be it. Then you've earned your place. But I think those sort of games would serve awfully an awful lot better. But players don't really think about it like that. And no. they, love, they love getting a crack off the, off the big hitters. There's no point in saying anything. No, they do. And they want to test themselves against the pace. They want to test themselves against the intensity. Like, they're unbelievably hard work themselves. But yeah, you, you're right, Mick. There's a... There's a, a graduated tier to to to, to maybe nav navigate when you get up to Division One, and like it should it should be a little bit more accessible for these counties. Whereby the counties you've named, they may have psychologically even going into the game, they, they might have a different outlook on it altogether. And like people were saying to me yesterday, 
oh, if Kildare go up, they'll get absolutely trounced. And I was, I was scratching my head saying, why would you get out of bed in the morning? Like, if that's your outlook, you know, you, you have to get up there and test yourself. And from a, from a promotional point of view, what it would do for the game is, is, is sensational, you know? And like, don't get me wrong, Mick, I was going down to that game, like, uh, you know, obviously from Killer One, and like you know, you hate, listen, should... demo, you hate awfully, and you're a Killer. <laughs> that's, that's the way it is. You were going down no, to that game. <laughs> you were going down to that game with, with ill will in your mind. See, that's the poison you have in your hearts, and uh, I, I tried to preach to love. And what I'm trying to say to you is, I'm only one parish over from Shinron, and like you would have seen the likes of Dee Cordial and that over the years, and the kind of freestyle hurling he had. To be honest with you, even the Offaly jersey, traditionally, I would have grown up, and when I was a kid, Offaly were winning, like and. They were a team you'd always admire. What I'm trying to say to you without patronising anybody, Hurling needs awfully right back up there, you know, right back up there. You're too much crack for anybody to hate as well. <laughs> so. but, but that's what I'm saying. Like, both teams probably deserve a shot. Like, your work has been gradual. And now, now, I believe there's still more work to be done too, even at under 14 level. It has to... It has to be sustained and your minor team was good last year, Mick, but like, will the work continue on again this year? I was involved with a small bit with NACE CBS this year and we played against Skull Cormac and uh, Skull Cormac played us in the semi-final of the B, obviously did very well in the college's A as well, but I was impressed. Obviously you look at Screeny and, but, but you, you know, he's shooting the lights out and we tried very, very hard to, to watch him that night. He's free taking and his ability to find scores, but you need three or four Screenies coming up every yeah. two or three years, you know, and, and that's the, that will only come at underage level. But the one thing I will say about Skull Cormac and the one thing I'll say about Offaly is the absolute compact shape that they had and the squeeze that they put on the opponents um, and the, the probably stranglehold they had over the middle third. That was common to both teams. So I don't know if it's an Offaly platform going forward, but certainly one that works while you regain your foothold in the game. Yeah, Screeny and Cole were actually playing for the 20s at the weekend. Yeah. They beat Westmead, I think it was 222 to 117. The minors and Cal came Kerry. on for the seniors as well, yeah. Uh, After playing under 20, Michael Cahill. Charlie, 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 Charlie Mitchell. Charlie, yeah. yeah, yeah. Charlie Mitchell, good, sorry, yeah. yeah, bigger part. A good player too, but awfully probably need to stay up in Division 1 a couple of years to get the likes of... Uh, well, I don't know when Adam Screen will be seeing the senior jersey because he probably has a fair bit of he's a fair Fitting bit of work up. to do. But yeah. the likes of James James Mahan, Breck and Kavanagh, and a few more who are maybe a bit physically more imposing, the likes of Dan Ravenhead as well. But they, yeah, it's going to take a while to, to get them through. And just on your point, uh, Damo, mm. that was an exceptional group of minors. But yeah, there's yeah. there's there's probably nothing like that group coming at the moment, if you get me. And so I you believe, need, yeah. You, you need really competitive teams every year. You need to be bringing through three or four every year, realistically. Um, 